All right. Um, okay, well, thank you uh, again for the invitation. So today, um, I wanted to summarize a couple of our recent uh, manuscripts uh, that were just recently published. So if uh, I'm gonna go, go ahead and start with this one, which I call it the metabolism in SAS. So again, this was just published a couple months ago, uh, and this is the actual reference. So I wanted just to go ahead from the beginning and tell you what this study was about and what it, it's going to tell you and not tell you. Um, so you, you feel like you're getting the information um, that you want out of it. Um, again, so our thought when we were you know starting to do this study was to explore metabolism and energy production. Um, and from individuals with SAS, of course. But again, it was just more of a exploration and probably more to generate questions more than answers really. And that's ultimately what, it, what it's gonna be. So, and we were able to detect some abnormalities um, in the cells and we will go through the, the process of what we did uh, as far as the, the methods and whatnot. Um, so we did detect some abnormalities uh, on how the SAS cells use and produce energy. And we'll go through those in a second. Now, what this is not gonna tell you, and I won't be able to tell you this, is, you know, after all this, what exactly does it mean for your child, right? Or your loved one um, in terms of, okay, so what diet is needed? Um, you know, should you stop eating McDonald's and eat Subway instead or whatever. I'm not going to be able to tell you specific diet recommendations or treatments based on our findings. And I'll go through the logic behind why that is. Um, but in case you're like, oh, this guy's not going to tell me um, what my diet should be for the next 20 minutes or 15 minutes then uh, to spare you the pain. Um, and then the second part of it is that this is a, a fairly complex um, paper, a lot of information and whatnot. So I'll, I'll try my best to to explain it as, as simple as it can be. Um, so it, uh, and many of you are very savvy and very knowledgeable when it comes to, to this sort of topic. I'm going to try to keep it as simple as I can for the majority of the audience. So um, at the end, you know, of course, you, you will have the opportunity to ask me any questions um, that if you wanted more information or or dive into the, the science behind it and whatnot. But again, I'm gonna to try to keep it very simple, All right? So, and again, this actually generated probably more questions than, than answers. So this is the, the study, um, how it was done. So we use a thing called the Biolog assay. So what you have is this plate that has 96 wells and you see the letters a to H here, numbers on this side. So each well has uh, a different concentration of a given substance, chemical, or whatnot. And then you're going to be adding the cells and see how the cells react. And, and really what happens is that depending on, on how the cells are reacting or using whatever is on that well, then they either produce no color or a little bit of color or really dark color, which is what you see here. So we, um, a couple of years ago, we started doing this. So we collected some blood samples and then from the blood, uh, we generated what we call lymphoblastoid cell lines. So those are, again, just blood cells that we, they have the ability to constantly reproduce and you can pretty well control They They don't die out basically, they, they stay reproducing, which is nice for, for this kind of experiment. And whoops, I went to the end. Let me just go back here. Um, and then what happens once you have with the, the cells, we starve them, right? So um, we deprive them from nutrients. So these cells, when you start working with them, they're gonna be super hungry and cranky and whatnot and ready to eat, right? So we, we then plate them into the wells, like you see here. And then the computer just analyzes the color, right? And then um, it tells you, okay, well, this is too much, too little. And that's, that, that's what the colors really will mean. So each 
uh, little curve here corresponds to each well. And again, you're looking at um, how, what energy was produced in the process uh, in this way, in, with this graphic, basically. So in this study, we, use, we started with eight different plates. So this is one plate, we used eight different ones. And to give you an idea, so number one to four, so the first four plates, um, they all have different energy sources. So each well will have nothing or a little bit of, you know, this sugar or that sugar that is modified somehow. So the first plate, so this one plate, had different uh, energy sources, uh, sugars, that is. Plates number two, three, and four, they have lipids, so fat or protein as your energy source. And again, remember these are cells that have been starved and are ready to eat, right? So uh, you're modifying the, the source of energy uh, for those first uh, four plates. And then the next four plates, so five, six, seven, and eight, they have exactly the same source of energy, which is glucose, but then you modify you, you add more things to the glucose. So you can add potassium or zinc or different things or, you know, different concentration of hormones. Um, and you see examples here. So thyroid, estrogen, and different substances uh, such as caffeine. And then you're gonna look exactly the same process. How do these cells use energy or produce energy uh, using the same sugar, but now modified uh, slightly with different you know, again, compounds or whatnot. So just keep that in mind. And then as an extra experiment, uh, we use a ninth plate, which is the tryptophan uh, plate, which I'll go through that and why we did it kind of thing. All right, so we had 11 individuals with SAS, six boys, six, uh, five girls. Um, this is the average age, which was six years, and you see the range three to 18. All individuals had confirmed diagnosis of SAS. They had different changes as far as the genetic information goes. Um, all of them had some degree of developmental delay. Five of them had autism. And again, through a psychenial experiment, uh, we compared the values that we generated with this 11 samples against 50 age match, typically developed uh, individuals. So there were three major findings, and that's that's what I'm going to cover today. Um, again, the oversimplified version of it. So finding number one, um, uh, remember that I mentioned the first four plates were different sources of energy. So the first finding that was significant is that the cells that came from SAS individuals had problems using what we call routine fuel sources. So the, one of those fuel sources in particular is what we call the phosphorylated glucose. So when we eat uh, any kind of sugar, that gets broken down into smaller pieces. And our main source of sugar is the glucose. So for glucose to be utilized, it goes through a long process that allows the cells to finally produce energy, which is ultimately what you want. So one of the steps in how you metabolize glucose is this phosphorylated glucose. So um, the cells that came from SAS individuals have problems using that uh, specific source. But then we also found, found that they like or responded better, the cells that is, uh, to other sources of energy, uh, such as maltose and sorbitol. So, um, Allow me to explain a little bit more about that. So when, if you think of uh, the main source of energy being glucose and not your body not being able to use it, then and this is just speculation at this point, really. Um, is that really maybe related to the fact that kids with SAS tend to be slimmer or have problems with their growth, perhaps, right? And then if you think of it also, glucose is the main source of fuel for your brain. So if you can, if your cells have problems utilizing the main source, then does that impair your brain development to some extent? In case you wonder, because I know some of you may Google this, where do you find 
uh, maltose or sorbitol. So maltose uh, is what comes from starches, really. Um, so we all eat them to some extent daily. Um, here are some, some examples of where you find it. And then sorbitol is a sugar alcohol and is found in fruits, including the uh, fake fruit avocado uh, here. So again, I'm not telling you that you should eat you know, starches and this specific types of things. I'm just telling you, okay, well, these are the things where this comes from. Um, in, in case that that proves to be the the, the point that we need to make. Uh, but again, that I cannot officially tell you those things uh, in good faith at this point. All right, so that was the first uh, finding. Finding number two is related to hormones. So if you remember, the plates five, six, seven, and eight had different sort of exposures, uh, including different hormones at different concentrations. So what we found, and one of the main things that uh, we found and highlighted here is that there was abnormal response to certain hormones and all the things that regulate how you metabolize energy. In particular, um, there was an increased response to estrogen and there were no significant differences with different concentration of calcium and vitamin D. So if this is kind of how the data is plotted in the end, so if you see um, the, the circles or the smaller sample is the SAS individuals and then the squares, the bunch of samples, those are the controls. And this is again, good I, to give you an idea why is it hard to give you final conclusion. So if you see there, there's a line here, which is kind of the average and the average here is going to be higher than the average here, 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 and in all of them. But you see the overlap, which is really what this is difficult to make any conclusion. So there's some typically developed children that will have similar levels compared to the SAS individuals. It's just as a group they were all on the higher side, right? And this is whenever we talk about results, that, that really is what happens. So there's some overlap between the controls and the individuals. But speaking about hormones in particular, what we found is that there was a dose dependent sort of response. So if you uh, change the dose on the estrogen, there was an according response to the cells. Um, and we, there's been some link between the SABI2 gene and estrogen for some time. Um, and to, to some researchers, is, ha, they have even postulated that uh, SABI2 could be a critical gene when it comes to the bone changes related to menopause and such as osteoporosis. Uh, so weak bones related to lack of estrogen uh, to put a to put it simple. So they, there's some link between SABI2 and estrogen that had been already established. So for us to find that, that there is some also alteration in the response of the cells with different concentration of estrogen could indicate again that maybe that, that's another area of, of interest that is being validated this way. And then I mentioned that there was no significant difference uh, when we modified calcium and vitamin D. So I know we measured it because it's something that we can do something about, but again, may, maybe it's not the cause of the bone problem. So if a child with SAS has some, some bone issues, it might not necessarily be related to vitamin D or calcium is what I'm trying to say. It might be some different explanation, potentially even response to hormones, including estrogen. And, and again, it's not that is a, a gender uh, difference. So it's not necessarily boys versus girls uh, kind of thing. Um, we all have estrogen in our bodies. It's just how we all respond to it and how much of it. All right. And then before I go into finding number three, uh, allow me to explain what tryptophan is. So tryptophan is an essential amino acid. Essential amino acids are those that our body does not produce naturally. So you need to get it from somewhere else. And the tryptophan is a precursor of a lot of important uh, brain compounds and molecules. Um, I'll show you that in a second. 
and depletion, so low levels of tryptophan has been associated with a variety of mood disorders. So if you look at, okay, where what does tryptophan do? Tryptophan um, is a precursor of serotonin, which is kind of the happy hormone uh, neurotransmitter kind of thing. So it's important for, for mood in general. Uh, you see melatonin here, which is important for sleep and sort of your pattern of sleep awake uh, and many other compounds that I'm not going to go into in detail here. So we use, again, a specific plate that had tryptophan in different concentrations and different forms of it. And we found that the SAS cells um, had also an abnormal uh, metabolism of tryptophan. Um, and interestingly, that same kind of finding had been produced using the same technique, this, this biolog plates that we're using here in a group of kids with autism before. So that kind of puts us in perspective, okay, maybe there's a link, common link between all these things. And this again is kind of how we get the data. Um, you have the control, the patient, sorry, on, on the darker side, on the left side, and then you have your controls. And then again, there was reuse response across the board, uh, depending independently, I guess, of how, what form of tryptophan you had. Um, and again, it, it might produce, it might be related to some of the other things that we're talking about, not only autism, uh, which is this ASD part, autism spectrum disorder, but tryptophan might also play a role in other things, including neurodevelopment and even mitochondrial function. Mitochondrial is just where your um, energy is produced inside the cell, so very important for our bodies too. All right, um, as far as the next steps, um, so again, it, in the ideal situation, if you had unlimited resources, this is kind of what you, a wish list that you will want to follow with. Um, so first, we want to make sure that this is not a finding that you see only in blood. So again, we only use blood. So we do have skin cells um, and we are going to try to replicate um, exactly the same thing uh, using skin cells. Uh, we have a limited amount of skin cells, but uh, we can tweak it accordingly and see if, if we can reproduce um, the findings. In the ideal situation, you would have used neurons, for example, but neurons are very hard to keep alive, basically, in a plate. So that's, that's why they're not easy to, to maneuver and you have to starve them. And if you starve neurons, they will die, basically. And then the second part of it is that we use only 11 samples in this study. So we, in the ideal situation, we would have many more samples, 50 or more, um, to validate it, right? And then maybe even to confirm if this anomalies can be something that we use to diagnose or even confirm SAS, um, that would be very useful. And then you can, just like you modified uh, you know, your sugars or your, your things that each well has, you can really modify any conditions you want, right? So you can coat each well with estrogen or with, you know, uh, whatever medication you, you think it, it could change things or this sugar or that sugar, you can tweak it accordingly. So in the deal situation, you, you can customize it as well. All right. So with that, um, I wanted to uh, say thank you to the foundation because they, they provided the funding for, for the study. Um, and if you have any questions, then feel free to, to reach out to me. And that is it for now. Thank you.